It's September 2006. Travis Alexander, a promising young salesman from California, goes to a work conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. His job for the conference is to deliver a motivational speech to his fellow employees, but sitting in the crowd is one of prepaid legal services' newest recruits. Her name is Jody Ann Arias. She's 27 years old and undeniably attractive. By all accounts, Jody is taken in by Travis's speech and makes a point of introducing herself to him after the talk. Travis doesn't know that their meeting signifies the beginning of the end. How could he? As far as Travis is concerned, Jody is an enchanting woman who wants nothing more than to adore him. But as a member of the Mormon church, Travis is a tad weary of diving into a relationship with her. His faith is a core part of his life since childhood. His parents were both heavily addicted to meth, leading to his grandmother taking him in. She introduced him to the church, and it held a really special place in his life ever since. This godliness does not suit Jody, as the church community disapproves of their would-be relationship. But they already talk every day, they exchange texts, calls, emails. Jody takes it upon herself to make the four-hour drive from her home in Palm Desert, California to visit Travis in Arizona, every chance she gets. But the secrecy brings so much tension, so Jody comes up with a new idea. In November 2006, just two months after their first meeting, she joins the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Travis doesn't see her decision as rushed, and he actually baptizes her himself. Even so, they do not officially begin a relationship for another three months. When they finally start publicly dating in February 2007, there are glimpses of happiness at first. They travel together, they see the sights as tourists, and they go on trips for Travis's work. Jody expands her childhood love of photography by documenting their trips together. But how long can this honeymoon phase really last? Even in the early days, a darker side of the relationship emerged. Jody does not take kindly to Travis having female friends, and her jealousy is plain to see. Travis is entirely enamored, however, and Jody's possessiveness only endears her to him even further. He sees her anger as passion, a sign of her commitment and love. But four months into dating, the tension is just too much and Travis calls off the relationship. But would Jody disappear from his life? Quite the opposite. Instead, she closes the physical distance between them, uprooting herself from California to live down the street 10 minutes from Travis's house in Mesa, Arizona. It isn't long before they start seeing each other in secret again, away from the judgmental eyes of Travis's friends and the church. Again, it doesn't last. This time, Travis realizes that he needs to turn his attention to dating women whose beliefs and ideals line up with his. Jody is too much of a seductress to ever be the angelic Mormon girl of his dreams. So in December 2007, with Jody living only 10 minutes from his house, Travis starts seeing other women. He asks out a woman from his church, and they start going on dates, but they're stalked incessantly by an uninvited guest. Jody turns her photography skills to taking pictures of Travis and his date from across the street while they're out. On two occasions, she goes as far as to slash the tires on his car, and on another occasion, slashes his date's tires. Now that Travis no longer wants her around, Jody develops effective ways of breaking into his house. She climbs on her hands and knees through the dog door and uses one sliding glass door that Travis never locks. She's even caught a few times. The most surreal was when Travis found her hiding behind his Christmas tree. At this point, Travis makes it clear to Jody that he wants nothing to do with her. Then, months later, in April 2008, 
he sends her a text one night. It reads, I'm at a nightclub right now, and it helped me come to the conclusion that you're one of the prettiest girls on the planet. Their relationship is instantly rekindled and they spend months exchanging sensual texts. In the first week of June 2008, Jody goes too far again. Travis discovers she's hacked into his Facebook account. He tells his friends and decides to end things with Jody for good. Everyone's relieved as his friends had doubts about her from the start. One of Travis's friends is Mimi Hall. She and Travis have plans to travel to Cancun, Mexico together on a work trip in June. A trip Jody was initially supposed to go on, but in the days leading up to the trip, Mimi doesn't hear from Travis. She checks with more of his friends, they haven't heard from him either, and it's been days since he showed up for work. With growing concern, Mimi and one of Travis's other friends go to his house on June 9th to check on him. His house is an expansive 4,000 square feet, a testament to his salesmanship, and he lives with several roommates. When the friends arrive to ask about Travis, his roommates tell them he's away on a trip to Cancun. The dread starts to sink in. Travis's roommates had no reason to think anything was wrong. There had been no signs of a break-in, nothing missing or out of place. They checked Travis's bedroom, no sign of him. Then they checked the ensuite bathroom. What they find can only be described as a horror show. Travis lies in the shower. He's been stabbed 27 times in the back. His throat is slit. He has a bullet wound in his head. There are six foot sprays of blood lining the walls. His body has been there for several days and decomposition has already started to set in. Mimi calls 911 immediately. Oh my God. 911 emergency. Hi, this what's going on? Um, a friend of ours is dead in his bedroom. We we hadn't heard from him for a while. We think he's dead. His roommate just went in there and and said there's lots of blood. I didn't go in, but I I can give you the phone to someone who went in there. Can yes, please. Has he been threatened by anyone recently? Yes, he has. Okay. He has a he has an ex girlfriend that's been bothering him and and um following him and slashing tires and things like that. And do you know the ex-girlfriend's name? Um, her, his, her name is Jody. The house is sealed off as a crime scene. In a thorough search of the home, police find a digital camera in the washing machine. It's damaged, but is sent off to forensics to see if any photos can be recovered. Amid the carnage in the bathroom, they find a well-preserved, bloody handprint. But where's the primary suspect, Jody? And what really happened to Travis? After Travis tells Jody to get out of his life for the final time, Jody travels to Redding, California to rent a car. She returns the car just three days later, but with over 2,000 miles driven. When the news breaks about Travis's murder, she posts a loving photo of him on her MySpace page. Pinned as the prime suspect by Travis's friends, it isn't long before the police get in contact with Jody. She tells him that, although she and Travis had previously been romantic, she hadn't seen him since she moved from Arizona in April. She denies being anywhere near Mesa, Arizona on the day of the crime, and voluntarily gives the detectives her fingerprints and a DNA sample, blissfully unaware of the storm of evidence brewing against her. Jody's prints perfectly match the bloody handprint. Her DNA reveals that her blood was present at the crime scene. Crucially, photographs are recovered from the damaged digital camera, unlocking a heinous story that Jody would have gladly taken to her grave. Each of the photographs bears a timestamp. They reveal that on June 4th, two days after renting the car, Jody visited Travis Alexander's home in Mesa, Arizona, as she had many times before. She didn't break in this time. She and Travis reconciled their differences once again and had sex. Photographs show both Jody and Travis naked and intimate. But the next photographs show Travis taking a shower, and in the next photo, his back 
turned to the camera. In the next, he is bloody and broken at the bottom of the shower. One of the last photographs, presumed to be taken accidentally, shows Jody's hand cleaning up blood with Travis's body lying limp in the background. The evidence of Jody's guilt appears indisputable. The police investigating the crime make a point of saying there has never been so much evidence against a person found at a crime scene. Jody is indicted for first degree murder and is found by police at her grandmother's home. As she's being escorted away, she asks the detectives, is there any way I can get my makeup on? Her psychopathic tendencies were on full display for the authorities. They then extradited her to Arizona without makeup, I might add, where she pleads not guilty. The attorney's office files a notice stating that they are seeking the death penalty for first degree murder in an especially depraved manner. Even with the mounting evidence, Jody's determined to tell her story. She makes bail and immediately completes an interview for the television show 48 Hours. In this interview, she claims she didn't murder Travis. Instead, it was a home invasion by a man and a woman. They shot Travis and attempted to shoot Jody too, but the gun jammed, and she was able to push it away, grab her purse, and escape. Apparently, feeling for her life, she drove to Northern California without reporting the crime. In an interview with Inside Edition, Jody says with certainty, no jury's gonna convict me because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. The trial begins on January 2nd, 2012. Jody has altered her appearance to make herself more appealing and innocent looking to the jury, but would it really matter? This exhibit 161 is when the camera, according to you, actually hit the ground, right? I don't know if it's hitting the ground as that photo was taken or not. So you don't know how this photograph was taken then, right? It could have been when I was trying to catch it. I don't know. At some point, the camera hits the ground, right? Yes. Jody decides it's in her best interest to represent herself in court. She tries to taint Travis's pristine reputation by submitting a series of letters into evidence. These letters allegedly reveal that Travis was a pedophile, but experts quickly dismiss them as forgeries. At this point, Jody tells the judge that she may be in over her head and requests her lawyer returns to represent her. Here, her story changes once again. She spins a new tale about her relationship with Travis, saying it was riddled with domestic abuse and violence. Did you ever author um, something called a continuum of aggression and abuse? Yes, I did. And what is that? Everything that you have reviewed, that you've read in this case, that you've seen, do you have an opinion, an ultimate opinion in your expertise about whether or not uh, Ms. Arias was in, in an, abuse, an abusive relationship. Yes, I believe she was in a re, uh, an abusive relationship. A long line of character witnesses are called to debunk Jody's claim. One after the other, they each confirm that Travis was a kind, church-going man. Jody again admits to being present at the crime scene. She confirms that she and Travis did have sex but when she accidentally dropped the digital camera, he got so angry that he attacked her and she was forced to act in self-defense. Travis's excessive injuries are enough to throw out this claim. More details come out. Receipts are brought to light showing that Jody bought a number of gas cans while renting the car in Redding, California, meaning she could make the 14-hour drive to Mesa 
without stopping at gas stations and leaving a paper trail. After months of courtroom drama and sensationalized twists and turns, the evidence is just too overwhelming. Thousands of people tune in to a live broadcast of the courtroom to hear the verdict. Hundreds of thousands of people worldwide anxiously await the news coverage. State of Arizona versus Jody Ann Arias, verdict count one. We the jury duly impaneled and sworn and the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant as to count one first degree murder guilty. On May 8th, 2012, nearly five years after Travis Alexander's mutilated body was found in the shower, Jody Ann Arias is found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Travis Alexander's family and friends cry tears of relief and sorrow at the sentencing, glad to finally be free from Jody and the whole media circus she created in the wake of the murder. One of Travis's friends, Clancy Talbot, says, Looking at Jody's face, I think this is probably the first time in her life she has ever been held responsible for what she's done. Ever. A charismatic killer who caught herself on film. This is the disturbing case of Jody Ann Arias. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to watch more of my videos, please watch away and share, hit the thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to get first look at new videos. Thank you. It really helps and supports the channel a lot. I'll see you real soon in the next video. Thanks.